In the summer of uh, 2014, I started writing what, uh, what would become my debut novel, a book called American War. Um, American War is the story of essentially a second American Civil War. Um, takes place a few decades from now. Uh, the America of that future world is a very different place. Its um, rising sea levels have wiped out the eastern seaboard. Florida's gone. The capital has been moved inland from Washington, D.C. to uh, Columbus, Ohio. Um, and long after it would do any good at all, uh, the federal government decides to impose a prohibition on fossil fuels as a way to, uh, to combat all of this. Um, by this point in time, uh, pretty well all the world has moved on to other sources of, uh, of fuel. Nonetheless, a number of southern states decide that they would rather secede than go along with this. Um, what follows is a second civil war, the kinetic part of which is over very quickly. The South loses, again. Um, and what follows that is a sort of years-long insurgency. Um, I've been on the road now for six months promoting the book, and the question I get, <clears throat> excuse me, the question I get more often than any is, why did you decide to write this? And the closest thing I can think of in terms of a Genesis moment is um, a vague recollection I have from many, many years ago now of watching an interview with a foreign affairs expert, one of these talking heads that they periodically bring in to, uh, to explain the world. And the interview was taking place in the immediate aftermath of um, a set of protests that had happened in Afghanistan. Local villagers were protesting against the US military presence there. And the question that was put to this gentleman was something along the lines of, why do they hate us so much? And as part of his answer, he noted that sometimes the special forces have to go into these villages and conduct nighttime raids uh, looking for insurgents. And when they do this, they will often um, ransack the houses or hold the women and children at gunpoint. And then he helpfully added, um, and you know, in Afghan culture, that sort of thing is considered very offensive. I remember thinking, you know, name me one culture on earth that would not consider this sort of thing offensive. Um, and that's when I first started thinking about this idea of, of taking the conflicts that have defined the world in my lifetime and um, effectively, these are conflicts in which U.S. involvement has been from a great distance and recasting them as elements of, of something close to home. And I couldn't think of anything more close to home than a second civil, civil war. Um, the point of this being to explore the idea that there is no such thing as a foreign kind of suffering, that we all react to injustice the same way. Some of us just have the privilege to believe otherwise. Um, I started writing the book in the summer of, of um, 2014. I finished the first draft almost exactly a year later. Two or three weeks after that, uh, Donald Trump announced he was running for president. Uh, the book came out in April. Um, and ever since then, it's been seen in a very different context than what I intended. This book I intended as being a sort of allegory or analogous novel has instead been seen as a kind of roadmap. You know, this is what could happen, which is strange to me because almost everything in the book is based on something that did happen. It just happened to somebody very far away. Um, and so what I'd like to do is, is tell you a little bit about some of the experiences I had as a journalist over the last 10 years that contributed to, um, to the novel. Um, these are experiences from places like Afghanistan and Guantanamo Bay where I went to cover the war on terror. Um, and I'm not sharing these experiences with you because they constitute a holistic understanding of the entire conflict, um, but rather because I think they represent snapshots of the reality of the last decade and a half. And to live in the United States in 2017 often to me feels like living in a country that's at constant war with reality. Um, I was 25 years old when I uh, got my first assignment to Afghanistan. At the time, I was working for a Canadian newspaper, and the Canadian presence was, was heavy in the south of, of Afghanistan. Um, so I ended up spending quite a bit of time in the NATO airfield in Kandahar, which is this sprawling mass of tents and repurposed shipping containers. Um, and a lot of the scenery in my, uh, in my novel is based on that kind of infrastructure. Um, when I first showed up, I was young. I had read far too much Hemingway. 
Um, and I had a very romanticized vision of the swashbuckling uh, foreign reporter who, you know, dodges the bullets and, and all of that nonsense, which turned out to be complete garbage. Um, none of that is true. Um, the very first experience I had in Afghanistan that stuck with me and actually formed the basis for a couple of scenes in, in the novel had to do with um, an assignment I had walking around with a polio vaccination team. I was working on the outskirts of the city. Um, being on the losing end of a war is akin to moving backwards in time. Diseases that might otherwise have been eradicated suddenly come back to life. And so this was my first trip outside of Kandahar Airfield. I'd arrived a few days earlier. To get out of Kandahar Airfield, you have to leave the inner wire and then the outer wire. The inner wire is a cordoned off area surrounding the base proper, and it's guarded by NATO troops. The outer wire is right by the highway, and it's guarded by uh, Afghan soldiers. The NATO troops have state-of-the-art equipment. The Afghan soldiers have flimsy hand-me-downs. But if ever there's an attack, 90% of the time, it's going to happen at the outer wire. And it was my first experience of this sort of hierarchy that exists in many, many systems, um, but in, in wartime was particularly enlightening, um, which is the sense that, yeah, we're all on the same team, but some lives are more dispensable than others. There were, of course, the, the sort of the, the kinetic experiences, the experiences of being hit by RPGs or that sort of the violence that's associated um, with covering warfare and that I thought would make up the bulk of my experiences. Most of it happened in places called Forward Operating Bases, or FOBs. Uh, unlike Kandahar Airfield, which is this massive small city in of itself, these tend to be very, very small and in very remote locations, which means that they get attacked much more often. Uh, at this particular FOB, we had shown up that night, we were walking back from the mess hall, um, pitch black, we hear a whistling in the air. And uh, months earlier, for insurance reasons, my newspaper had sent me to war correspondent training, which basically boils down to, if you hear a whistling sound, drop to the ground. <laughs> so of course, that's what we do, we drop to the ground. Um, and what followed was a process of entirely dumb luck. Um, even the person firing this RPG has no idea where it's going to land. It happened to land over there instead of over here, and that's why we were safe. Um, and for a while, I thought this would be the kind of experience that stuck with me afterwards. Um, but that didn't turn out to be the case. This is a ramp ceremony. In this particular case, it was for two Canadian soldiers who had died when they stepped on an IED. Uh, while on patrol. Customarily, when there is a ramp ceremony at Kandahar Airfield, um, soldiers, political representatives from the other NATO countries will come and pay their respects. And so what you're seeing here is a very small sliver of the number of people who showed up that day. Um, the reporters on that day were stationed right next to the ramp. We saw the caskets go up into the plane. Um, and for very obvious physical and emotional reasons, the people carrying these caskets look to be in obvious distress. And at the time, I thought I understood why. I thought I understood all of the reasons why. Um, but there was one, one detail that I only found out when talking to an officer later on that I hadn't realized before. And it has to do with that casket, um, which is much, much heavier than it would otherwise be. This was a very hot day. It was 100 plus degrees. A couple of people had fainted while standing at the ramp ceremony. And that casket, in order to preserve the body for the long journey home, is also filled with pounds and pounds of ice. It's been almost exactly 10 years to the day I took that photo. I don't remember much about the caliber of the bullets, which regiment was based where, all of that stuff escapes me, but I will never forget the detail about the ice in the casket. A year after my first uh, Afghan assignment, I was offered the chance to go to a very different outpost in the War on Terror. Um, the Guantanamo Bay detention camps are obviously very infamous, um, but they also represent the only place I have ever been during my journalistic career that can truly be described as Kafkaesque. Um, <laughs> every single reporter in the history of Guantanamo Bay has gone to take a picture of this sign. <laughs> Um, the thing to, to know about Guantanamo Bay is it was built very, very quickly. Not just the detention camps themselves, uh, but the entire legal and bureaucratic system around them were built in a hurry. And you can see this in almost every aspect of this place. 
especially in the language. So my first, uh, my first trip there, I was asking one of the soldiers a question, and I made the mistake of referring to the people who are kept in this place as prisoners. And immediately I was corrected. We don't have prisoners here, sir, we have detainees. And there's a very real reason for this. Prisoner implies a prison sentence, which is a finite thing. Uh, detainees, especially so-called enemy combatants, can be held indefinitely. Um, when I went there, and I suspect this is still the case today, most of the prisoners were kept in three camps. <clears throat> Excuse me. Camp four, camp five, camp six. Camp four was modeled after a medium security facility, which meant that, for lack of a better word, um, the prisoners had lots of perks that the others in camp five and six would not. Um, these include communal living. You get to spend time with other people. Um, you get to do your own laundry. You get what are called comfort items, um, which include things like prayer beads, uh, pens that are specially designed so that you can't use them to stab someone, uh, eye shades because the lights never go off in Camp 4, um, toiletries that come in these little condiment packets that look like McDonald's ketchup packets. Um, these are the perks of living in Camp 4. In addition to that, out in the rec yard, there was this sort of bulletin board where the soldiers would sometimes place heavily vetted copies of news articles from the BBC and other sources, and for reasons I still don't quite understand, a copy of the Geneva Conventions. Um, this is Camp 5. Camp 5 and Camp 6 are supermax facilities where the non-compliant prisoners are kept. Uh, this means that for the vast majority of them, it is 23 hours or more a day of isolation in a cell not much bigger than this red circle I'm standing in. Uh, when you do get to go outside, you are in a rec yard that's fenced in, you are alone, and you're monitored the whole time. Um, camps five and six also happen to be the places where the, the government kept the prisoners who are effectively too innocent to charge and too guilty to let go. Um, which constitute the bulk of the remaining prisoners in Guantanamo Bay. Carol Rosenberg, who's a reporter for the Miami Herald and who knows this place better than anyone else on earth, has referred to these people as forever prisoners. And that's what this place is. Um, and that's what a lot of places in this age of the war on terror are. This is a place that neither exists on US soil nor outside US soil. It's not subject to US law, nor is it not subject to US law. It's a forever place, and it seems in many ways sort of violently immune to the passage of time. And that's why I spend a lot of time talking about, about these places. Um, you know, I, I moved to the US a few years ago. I, I, I live here now. Um, my daughter was born here. I'm invested in this place. Um, and I think that living in America today in, in in a time when almost daily there seems to be some new outrage, some new unbelievable thing happening, this era and what happened during this era is going to be very easy to forget. Um, it is astounding to me today to see someone like George W. Bush referred to as a promising amateur artist and a newfound member of the resistance, as opposed to somebody who started an unnecessary war that killed half a million people. That is bizarre to me. Um, because I think forgetting is a form of violence. It's, it's a violence against reality. And any place that commits violence against reality inevitably commits violence against itself. Thank you so much. <laughs>